Hey, Eastern Heights, welcome to our Good Friday service. Uh, traditionally for Good Friday, we'll be, we'll be meeting in the sanctuary. It would be uh, dark. We would have some candles lit. We'd be able to do some music. Uh, because of what's going on, we're not able to do that. So uh, seven of us have gotten together. We've taken the seven final sayings of Jesus and spread them out among ourselves uh, to kind of share our insights from these passages and to uh, also converse with each other. I wanna encourage you also uh, afterwards as we go through these as a family, you can sit down and talk about some of these passages uh, among your family and what are these passages about and what are they, uh, what's the application? Of course, Good Friday is kind of a strange thing as Christians for us to celebrate because in one sense we're celebrating somebody dying, uh, but we're able to call it Good Friday because we also know about the resurrection that comes on Easter, and that's what makes it a Good Friday. Otherwise, as we talked about, Jesus's death would be just kind of a sad and morbid situation. So uh, I'm gonna real quick just introduce everybody who's going to be sharing with us uh, today. So uh, obviously myself. Uh, Jason, you want to say hello there? Hi there. All right, Jim Ritchie. Hey, how y'all doing? All right, Wang Yusui. Hello. And Julie Pavey. Hey, guys. And then Tex Ritter. If you can read lips, Texas. And Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to share with this. I, I have the, uh, the very first passage. And so we're going to go ahead and take a look at that passage here. And so you guys got your Bibles. You can join us or you'll see it up here on the screen. And it is from Luke uh, 23, verse 34. It says these words, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lot. And my, my quote is, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. As, uh, as I was thinking about this passage and what it talked about, I thought it was kind of strange. It's one of those verses that's often quoted, but rarely understood. Uh, Jesus, keep in mind at this point, he's been stripped, he's been beaten, he's been publicly humiliated, he's been nailed to a cross, and he says to them what? They, they don't know what they're doing. And of course, they know exactly what they're doing. I mean, there, no one was innocent at this point. The rulers, the soldiers, the people watching, everyone is well aware of the situation. And now they might be ignorant of the exact identity of Jesus, uh, being the Messiah, but they're well aware that they're dealing with this innocent man that's now hanging on the cross. And yet Jesus says, forgive them. And so I was kind of thinking about that. What's he trying to say behind that? And I think to kind of understand this understanding of forgiveness, there's three things that we need to understand that forgiveness is not. The first thing is that the act of forgiveness does not make an action acceptable or correct that when you, forgiveness doesn't say something that is sinful is no longer sinful. The second thing is that forgiveness does not absolve those doing the wrong of responsibility. That then the forgiveness is sin, there's still a responsibility to admit that you've done something wrong, to, to repent of what you've done, and if possible, to strive to make it right. The third thing I see with forgiveness is forgiving someone does not always change that person. And we would hope that if we go and we forgive them, and then there's going to be this traumatic change. But Jesus hangs on the cross and he forgives them, and none of them change. The, the rulers are still mocking him, the people are still mocking him, the soldiers are still throwing lots for his clothes. So those are three things that forgiveness is not. So what are three things that forgiveness is? Well, the first thing is forgiveness shows that sin needs to be forgiven. The very concept that Jesus has to say forgive them shows that they're doing something that is wrong. It's, it's showing that there's a a sinfulness going on there, and that Jesus is, is making that known. What you're doing is wrong, and therefore I'm giving you forgiveness. Granting forgiveness allows the one who has done wrong to take responsibility. It, it, it's a kind of a strange thing, but until someone knows that there's forgiveness, only then are they free then to step forward and start changing, to repent, to do something different. As long as they don't have that sense of forgiveness, they don't have that freedom, they kind of can stay in that sin, defend that sin continue doing that sin. But as Jesus grants forgiveness, then it allows us to step up and take responsibility and say, yeah, I have been sinful. I've been forgiven, and I got to take responsibility for the sins I've been forgiven of. 
And when we allow it, forgiveness does change our character. There's people at the cross, he says, forgiving them. We don't see it change their character, but we do see a change in character of a lot of other people. We see Peter who denied Jesus, and, and when Jesus forgives him, we see a change. When the disciples who all ran away, when Jesus forgives them, we, we, we see a change. Even some of those people who are probably at the cross mocking later accepted Jesus Christ. We know that among the early converts of some 3,000, some of them were Pharisees, probably were at the cross, and we see this, this change occur. So Jesus' forgiveness really does change lives and opens up an eternity with God if we're allowing uh, to accept that forgiveness. And then there's one other thing I thought was kind of interesting is Jesus says this out loud. Now, we know it's addressed to God the Father, but he's saying out loud, which makes me realize that he says it out loud because he's wanting us as followers to do this. We also are to forgive others. As Ephesians 4.32 says, forgive each other just as Christ has forgiven you. So that's some of the insights that I had uh, looking at that passage. Uh, what were some of the things that maybe you guys saw when you hear that passage when he says to uh, forgive? Uh, what, what were some things that maybe you caught? I kind of got uh, a little caught up in how they managed to go cast lots for what he had. Uh, just thinking how human the people that were involved were, which mm. I've always equated the forgive them, they know not what they do uh, because they didn't see the big picture. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Anyone else insights that you, you get when you think about that passage? Jason, what did you see something in it? Yeah, I was thinking just the amazement at God's grace that maybe we think God can forgive us, you know, many years after we've screwed up. But in that situation, he was forgiving them in the very moment of their sin is, is really quite powerful. Yeah, yeah. To follow up on that, something that you said about um, forgiveness needs to, that Jesus spoke it out loud. And sometimes we can forgive somebody in our heart, but there's something powerful about speaking forgiveness over somebody. And, you know, and it's a, there's times that are appropriate. And then there's other times that you don't say that, that you do forgive them in their heart because it might get worse if you say, well, I forgive you. And they ask, they say things like, I, I don't need forgiving. But, um, I think that if there's something powerful to say, I forgiven you. And for that person to, to own that and, and realize that, that there's been reconciliation in that relationship because of that. Mm, mm. Yeah, there, yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. Along, along the lines of speaking that out loud, <clears throat> wasn't there somewhere else where Jesus said um, he said something or prayed something um not for the father to hear but so others would know would hear and know um something but yeah my memory fails me i can't remember what the somethings were it's when he was praying for his disciples yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think the special prayers that jesus does to god the father it's unique that um the Holy Spirit moved on the writers to record those in the Gospels to get these, these special conversations going on that we know they're applicable to us and apply to us. So, well, thank you guys for doing that. Let's, let's look at our next passage. I think, uh, Jim Ritchie, you have that next passage. And so I'm going to put up the verse and I'll let you uh, share it and then let you share your, uh, share your devotional there. So let me bring up that verse. <coughs> And I'll let you go ahead and share that. Okay. Um, Jesus answered him, tell, tell you, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. This verse is, is one of the most hardening verses I've ever, that I've read and heard. 
for me as a believer, it's so encouraging for me that the thief could do nothing for himself except ask Jesus for help. He could not lift a hand, a foot, to bring about his own salvation. He could, he could perform absolutely no good works. Jesus offered him the gift of God's grace, and he took it. I believe countless people have read this story and also been moved to ask Jesus for forgiveness. It makes, makes me, every time when we read it, simply ask for good grace to cover us. The passage made me think of Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace we have been saved through faith, not of our own doing. It is a gift of God. By opening paradise to believers, he's proven that righteousness has its reward and peace with God, whatever happens in, in this life. This principle remains true today. Some people come to Jesus when it, it, with ulterior motives, seeking advantage in this world. Others come knowing that his purpose is to get us safely into heaven, not merely just to get comfortably through this life. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and no one is beyond redemption when there still remains, remains a fear of God. Anytime death takes us from not towards our goals, I need to rethink my goals. And I know when I read and learn about Jesus, it is awakening of my soul with my heart, when my heart is open. I know I don't want to be that thief asking at his death for forgiveness. I want to know the paradise of Jesus now by glorifying his name with love and being humble. Uh, but doing all things with love and getting out of myself will only help me grow. This is not an easy task and I have to keep my faith. I know I'm a self-centered sinner and I make my Mistakes daily. My faith has been shaken throughout my life. I have left God. He didn't leave me. But sometimes that happens daily, and He's always there with open arms. I know my pain has brought me closer to God and keeps me humble. Knowing that I am not alone with this journey has made a difference in my life. The journey of this life we are trudging as sinners has a glorious reward waiting for us in paradise with Jesus. Um, that's what I thought about this verse about with the thief not want to be asking at the last for his forgiveness. That's all I have. Thank you, Jim, so much for sharing that. Some of y'all, do you have some insights from that as he shares that? Jim, I love your heart. I love your story. I love that you've experienced that joy of knowing that God has welcomed you into paradise and, and he welcomes all of us uh, by, by grace. Thank you for sharing. Welcome. Thank you. What you said, Jim, kind of reminds me of John 10, 10, where it says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly or more fully. Now you're like, I don't want to wait to the end to accept Christ. I want to know that fullness. Now I want to, I want to taste that paradise. I want to taste that relationship with Christ now, because um, you know that that is, that is true joy. So thank you for sharing that. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I thought that was one of the most powerful parts about it was just uh, often we think about going to paradise and you're speaking about, you know, enjoying that now, that joy of the spirit being in our lives. And uh, I thought that was really, really insightful. So thank you so much for doing that. Well, Sheila, you yeah. are our next uh, passage. So let me bring that up and I'll let you share that. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home, John 19, 26 and 27. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, gasping for air, he took time to fulfill a family obligation. As the firstborn son, Jesus had responsibility of caring for his widowed mother. 
now that he was dying, Mary would need another male to support her. The likely solution should have been one of her other children. From the scriptures, we know that Jesus had brothers and sisters, but none of them were at the cross. In fact, the scripture records that they thought Jesus was crazy, and they did not believe that he was the son of God. But Mary, by her presence at the cross, had embraced the truth that Jesus was the Messiah. In fact, it had been prophesied at Jesus' circumcision what would happen to her. This was what was said in Luke 2:34, and a sword will pierce your own soul. The grief of losing her son combined with the confusion of the death of her Savior meant Mary was in a vulnerable state, and Jesus knew this. Therefore, Jesus selected a new son for Mary, someone who would share her grief and someone who would share her beliefs. Described as the disciple whom Jesus loved, we know that this was John. John was the only disciple to make it to the cross. John witnessed what Mary witnessed. John grieved like Mary grieved. And John believed Jesus was the Messiah like Mary believed. And so John was a likely choice for Mary to become her son. But Mary wasn't the only one who benefited by this relationship that Jesus instituted while hanging on the cross. John, too, would need affirmation. John, too, would need confirmation of his faith. I'm sure there were many conversations between the two of them as they lived in John's home. We later learned that John was exiled to Patmos because of his faith in Jesus. I imagine that the encouragement he received from Mary in his previous years might have helped him persevere in his faith. I am thankful for a Savior that cares for our every need. From Jesus' actions toward his mother, I know that he cares for me and he cares for you. And he calls us into community to encourage and affirm our Christian faith. And so in these crazy times and on this very special Good Friday, we have the opportunity as Christians to encourage and affirm one another's faith through Jesus' example. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, any insights on what Sheila had to say or on that passage? Wasn't well, John, I know he died on Patmos, but obviously he lived longer than any of the other disciples. You think that figured in to Jesus picking, picking him? Possibly. Yeah. He had a role to fulfill. I've always found this passage just to be um, awkward in the series of things that Jesus says. It, it seems almost completely out of place, which makes it to me even more important because you, you would, you know, a number of these statements are talking about what I'm doing and why I'm dying. And then all of a sudden he, he jumps in about, I need my mom taken care of, which just reminds us, I think all the time, how much Jesus cares for us and is concerned about the, the simple things that we think, oh, God really doesn't really care about that. And especially like this time, we'll be like, does God really care about us being sick? Does he really care about this virus? And um, passages like that give me great comfort that he cares about the, the small things too. Mm -hmm. Any, uh, anyone else like make an insight on the passage? All right, well, Julie, I believe your passage is next. Is that correct? Yes. All right, let me, let me bring up the passage for you here. Okay. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. Uh, the youth group has spent the past several months studying suffering. We spent a great deal of time del delving into questions like, why does suffering exist? Does God really understand pain and suffering? 
Where does comfort come from? And how can I honor God in my suffering? Of course, when we began this session, we had no idea we would find ourselves where we would find ourselves just a short time later. We can't get through the daily news without hearing about COVID-19 and the suffering it is causing. While this novel vi coronavirus has definitely turned our lives upside down, we know it isn't the only cause of our suffering. Suffering comes, it comes from many different sources, the loss of loved ones, loss of jobs and income, broken relationships, illness. One thing we try to impress upon the students is that we will all experience some level of suffering as we live out our lives. How we respond to that suffering will be defined in large part by our relationship with Jesus Christ and our trust in God. When we walk through, when our walk through life becomes difficult, it is often easy to question where God is in the suffering, especially when physical pain is involved. When my dad was in his last weeks um, of his battle with cancer, he began to experience a great deal of pain. One day in particular, the pain became so intense that he cried out to God, asking him to take away the pain. When the pain did not subside, he began to pray for God to just take him. The cry gave way to an anguished plea, God, why won't you take me? Please take me from this pain. Over and over, he repeated this plea, each time a little weaker, but a little more indignant. In his pleading, dad was not doubting God. On the contrary, calling to God affirmed that he knew that God was still with him, and knowing that brought dad comfort. When Jesus cried out, he too was experiencing pain. He had survived a beating that should have killed him, and now he was hanging on a cross waiting for his final breath. This, however, was not the pain that caused him to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? No, this cry of anguish came from deep within, an agony like no other. The pain was born out of separation from his father as the weight of all our sins were heaped upon him and in one fell swoop, he was wrenched from his father's hands and out of his presence. We know that we are not left hopeless in our suffering because God who created a good work in and through Jesus was faithful to reconcile him. And as Paul reminds us, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Thanks for sharing that, Julie. That was really powerful. Uh, insights on that passage. Just what an incredibly timely message. And just the things that you mentioned about suffering and how we walk through that. Um, we need to hear that. We need to yeah. hear that, that God is with us. And I love what you said about with your dad crying out to God, that it wasn't that he doubted God, but instead that he grasped onto him even more so because he knew that right. it was the only hope. So thank you for that really personal insight and that personal story. Thank you. Absolutely. Any, anyone else on that passage? Anything that jumps out at you with it? Yeah, I think, you know, going through the pain of the I'd universe, like to make a comment on... Who's talking? Go ahead, Jason. Go ahead, Jim. Okay, I just... I, I just wanted to say, Julie, Julie pronounced that, that Hebrew really well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's one reason I didn't take that passage. I couldn't say it. So, <laughs> <laughs> but no, the, the the pain of what we go through. I just when you said about your father, I thought of Kathy, and you know, towards the end of her life, and at the end, she she was at peace. I mean, she was she was in pain, but she just knew that she was going home. And I just in today's time, you know, that guys that gets me through the that pain she went through, and my pain of her being gone, of how we go on with our lives, and know that. Uh, He'll still take care of us no matter what, as long as we have faith. Absolutely. Yeah, incred incredibly timely passage. 
And I think that's neat that you were able, um, completely unintended, to spend time with the youth uh, answering some of those questions before this even occurred. So it's a, definitely you see God's hand at work in that. Well, Julie, thank you so much for doing that. Wayne, uh, I believe that you have the next passage. So I'm going to bring that passage on up for Well, you're having more trouble with this than I did. Can't hear you. You're muted, Chris. I'm, I'm going to let you go ahead and share your passage. I, I lost your slide there. Okay, well, I'm doing John 19, 28 and 29. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. As we see in this passage, Jesus said, I thirst, as he was dying on the cross. We don't know who he was speaking to. Possibly it was the Roman soldiers who stood watch. As we just read in the passage, near Jesus' cross, there was a bowl of sour wine, or wine vinegar in some translations. This was a cheap drink that soldiers, other lower class people, uh, used to refresh themselves. So someone, probably a soldier, dipped a sponge in the sour wine, and lifted it up on a branch of hyssop. Jesus accepted the offer of the sour wine, unlike in an earlier passage in Mark 15, 23, when he refused a drink that was laced with myrrh, a narcotic used to deaden pain. That drink he refused just before being crucified. John said that I thirst was spoken to fulfill scripture. The scripture John had in mind probably was Psalm 69, 21, which says, they gave me poison for food and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. There, there the psalmist is asking God to help him because of the things the enemy was doing to him. Therefore, what John had in mind when he tells us that Jesus said, I thirst, probably was to de demonstrate the desolation that our Lord was uh, feeling there on the cross. That is, John was further showing how much agony Jesus was suffering how painful and alone he felt, just as in that psalm. However, as we will see in the next verse, um, when Jason does John 1930, the whole horrible experience was about to end. Some writers point out that John specifically mentions that hyssop was used in giving the sour wine to Jesus. You may recall that in the Old Testament, hyssop was used at the first Passover. Moses was instructed uh, to have the head of each household strike the lintel and doorposts with hyssop that had been dip, dipped in the blood of a freshly slain lamb. Other Old Testament passages tell us that hyssop was used to sprinkle blood and in other places, 
to sprinkle water. For example, in Leviticus 14, the cleansing of lepers used hyssop to sprinkle water on the leper. The idea that these Bible scholars are getting at um, is that hyssop was used in cleansing and protecting. Thus, it's probably significant that on the cross, he would be offered a drink from a branch of hyssop. After all, Jesus was the Lamb of God, whose blood was shed to cleanse us from our sins and to keep us protected from the eternal death stored up for the devil and his followers. Could it be that John was driving that point home in this passage? Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, for sharing that. Any insights um, as he shares that? Uh, that was really powerful about the hyssop branch and connecting that into the Old Testament and bringing that all the way forward so you see the, the messianic connection there and that, that promise of Jesus Christ uh, being seen in the Old Testament, you know, beginning even at Passover, uh, which is also being celebrated here in April and coming all the way forward to, to that point. So thank you for sharing that. Anyone else, some insights? I think the fact that he thirsted also showed his humanity because he suffered the cross as a man. He felt every pain. That's one of the things I took away. Thank you, Tex. Yeah, it's a, a good reminder that we know that that pain was real for him. Anyone else on, on that passage with Wayne that jumped out at you? Wayne, you did such a great job. No one, no one wants to the, the challenge you. So I encourage you as you're uh, watching this, this is a great passage to talk about with the family uh, on its application into your life. And um, uh, as frequently happens when I teach something, people fall asleep. <laughs> and that's what's going on right here in this group. Well, well we, we are proud of you for staying home. We just didn't know that you moved to your home in Colorado. So um, thanks for zooming in with us. All right. Our, our next one is Jake. Oh, yeah. Yosemite. Yosemite. I, I'm sorry. Um, mountain's a mountain. Uh, <laughs> so Jason, you're up next for us. You want to uh, go ahead and share your passage and then your devotional. Yeah, we'll see if you have a slide for me. Hold on for, hold on for a second. I'll try it again. <laughs> All right, I think your slides coming up. This is John nineteen thirty. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This verse uh, has a, a deep well of meaning. Uh, you could argue that the entire New Testament is answering the question, what was finished? when Jesus said, it is finished. Uh, the apostles spend many pages fleshing out what that means. So I'm gonna to try to summarize that in three points. They all start with P. I'm gonna use a lot of words that start with P. So for you kids out there, try to count how many P words you hear tonight. I'm gonna argue that when Jesus said, it is finished, he was finishing a plan, number one, Number two, a purchase, and number three, a people, a plan, a purchase, and a people. So when Jesus says it is finished, he's implying that something was started. 
We know from Hebrews 12 that Jesus is the author and the perfecter, p -p perfecter of our faith. Uh, so he is finishing a plan that God had started from the beginning. Uh, we know in Isaiah 53 that the prophets also could see this plan because Isaiah said that he was pierced for our transgressions and was crushed for our iniquities. Uh, at Pentecost, Peter preached about God's plan when he said that the ruling leaders handed over God's uh, handed over Jesus by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. Um, so, so first of all, Jesus completed a plan. Uh, what was the plan supposed to accomplish? I will argue it was a purchase. Uh, we see this in several passages in the New, the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, it says that you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. In um, Matthew 20, Jesus was aware that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Paul says this in 1 Timothy 2 as well. He gave himself as a ransom for all people. So Jesus was paying a price to ransom someone. And finally, in Colossians 2, it says that Jesus forgave us all our sins, canceling our debts, nailing them to the cross. So this is a purchase, is, is part of the plan. But what was God purchasing uh, when he finished his work on the cross? And I'm going to argue that it's you and me, a people. Jesus finished a work of reconciling a people to himself. In 2 Corinthians 5, we read, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself in Christ. In Ephesians 5, we get this lovely image of Christ and his bride, um, where it says Jesus gave himself up for her to present her to himself. So Jesus was finishing a purchase of a people to bring to himself. And the most powerful passage I will share from Revelation 5, uh, we have an image of the lamb who was slain, surrounded by living creatures and elders who represent all of creation and all authority in heaven and earth, bowing down to the lamb who was slain. And what do they sing? Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood, you ransomed or purchased a people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So when Jesus cries out, it is finished, he has finished. Amen. Thank you, uh uh, Jason, I really appreciate that. that really great. Question. I loved your three P's there. Could could you do the P's for us one more time? Give us the the three P's so we can remember them. Plan to purchase a people. Excellent. So, any insights on what Jason had to share? Were there seventeen different P words? <laughs> That's how many I counted. Did you count that many? There was a lot. I counted 17. So kids, let us know. Nice All right. All right. So comment on how many P words you yeah, counted. So we'll find out who won. Any other insights? Jason, I had read that um, the it is finished could also be translated um, paid in full. It is paid in full. And I thought that just fits perfectly with what you were saying. I really enjoyed your devotional. And I'm sure in the Aramaic, it starts with the letter P. Oh, oh you're on mute, Wayne. We didn't hear your punchline. No, I was just thinking <laughs> the Greek is Natalistai, but that... That's Greek, so that doesn't count. 
<laughs> All right. Well, our last one, our last one comes from Tex Ritter. So Tex, let me, I'm going to try and bring up your uh, verse here. Ah, the interweb works. But, uh, Luke 23, 46. Jesus called out in a loud voice. Father, under your hands, I trust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. This was the seventh of the seven sayings that Jesus made on the cross. To me, it's very powerful. It made me want to understand a little more about what it took to be able to say that uh, the only man who was ever a god was also a man the very man who when i was an eight-year-old boy i decided that i was going to follow you know i figured out way back then that it was just simply admitting that there was only one way to get the peace that you can know through him whether it was a time of joy like the birth of my children Boy, howdy, I remember how scared that made me and Karen uh, to think that we could even be smart enough, let alone grown up enough to attempt to raise a small child. Nowadays, I get that same joy when I get a chance to look at my two grandsons. I can just see them do anything, just about. I just swell up with pride. You know, and that feeling that I get can only be matched by the pride that grandma feels. Uh, you know, I know how much love we have for them. I remember times when I could chat with my Lord when times were kind of tough. Uh, I remember when I lived, went to war. I confess that, you know, it was God that made me be able to even get through that experience. You know, there's been many other times of fear I've encountered. One time I even got told there was malfunction on an aircraft I was riding in that we were probably going to crash and die and I felt his presence then I feel his presence when I've lost friends and loved ones I've gone to the funeral home in the cemetery you know God's always been my anchor and anchor holds because of my faith it made me think about uh, how this particular Bible verse how I should look and maybe consider what was Jesus' thoughts while he was a man? Even though he was a perfect man, he faced death on earth, just like most of us providing the good Lord carried to get to death. You know, what was he actually thinking? What was his concern? What was running through his mind when he was actually meeting death? When he breathed his last? As best I can tell, it seems to me that he was thinking about his father's plan little old me, the all-seeing, all-knowing God who created each, who created and knew each step of what was even getting ready to happen. You know, he knew that in three days' time, he would come out of that borrowed grave on that glorious Sunday. That, my friends, is why I celebrate this day. Now Jesus knew that he was going to be back in glory soon with his father. You know, when I consider this little blue marble that we're all just riding around on, and, uh, you know, what does it mean to me thinking about that? The best answer I can come up with is that of faith, which I think the best definition is you know, the substance of things hoped for uh, and yet unseen. Uh, I know faith. I found it in Jesus, you know, it's manifested in his all-knowing that his father had everything under control when he breathed his last breath on the cross and gave up his spirit. The, that's the one I want to hang my eternity on. That's the one I want to put my trust in. That's the one I can still contemplate with care for someone as vile and wretched as I am. You know, he came down from throne glory just to endure all that just to get rid of my sins. He truly showed nothing and has shown nothing but love to me throughout my life. You know, why would anybody want to look anywhere else? You know, 
in all my years, no one has ever had my best interest at heart. My parents have, my wife has, a lot of people have, but not to the extent that my Lord has. You know, he's truly shown that love to me. Today, we live in a very difficult time with this virus thing running around. Uh, within the last week, I've even unfortunately seen people die before my very eyes from this COVID thing. It's attacking us all. And, you know, I see a lot of people die in the hospital. And each time, I, when someone breathes their last breath, it always, to this day, runs to my life. Did they know the Lord? Will they get an opportunity to spend time in eternity with Jesus? You know, please, if you don't see what your life would look like in that situation, after you pass from this little blue marble, please, Please just consider putting your trust in the one who holds the future, including our everlasting eternity. If you don't know Jesus or you choose not to know Jesus, you're going to end up in a lake of fire, he promised. If you can't see what the future looks like, please, if you haven't asked Jesus to come into your life, I can unequivocally tell you that he cares for you. We celebrate Easter because that Sunday morning, many, many years ago, the tomb was empty. How many men do you know can make that claim? I know that some glorious morning, when the trumpet of the Lord will sound and time will be no more, that Jesus is going to call me home, whether it's then or before then. Can you know that you're going to be called home? You know, if you can't, then please. Ask me, ask, ask, ask any of those folks that are on these Zoom screens for this meeting. You know, it's real easy. All you need to do, and any one of us can make it as easy as ABC. Admit, believe, confess. Thanks for allowing me to share. Contact, that was very powerful. Thank you so much. I just could see in your heart that crying out, and I just echo that, to make that decision for Jesus Christ, as we have shared these, if you've not made that decision, uh, please do, and you got questions, reach out to us, and uh, we'd be glad to talk to you. Anyone else, is this text share, that would be powerful, in sites or anything you'd like to add to that? Now I know what Wayne felt like. Well, uh, we'll text. Oh, Jason, were you saying something? Just, I thank you, Tex, for reminding us that this is a matter of life and death, how we respond to Jesus' words. It truly is. And all you got to do is walk into where I work one day, and it becomes pretty apparent. I was just thinking how Jesus, in saying, I commend my spirit to you, Father, we don't always, not all, will have that. I think that was part of Texas' point, that we don't, we don't know when that's going to be. And so whatever, you know, whatever we have, to live today in, in that life, you have to already know that, Lord, I've already commended my life, my spirit to you. I've accepted you into my heart, and um, I, I do, Lord, right now. I commend my spirit to you, and if you take me today, thank you. And I'm ready. Excellent. I, Thank I you. think sometimes we think we can just, we'll figure it out later. We might just put it on a pause. But when we do that, we have already made a choice because there's only two sides, right? There's no fence straddling. There's, you either have or you haven't accepted Christ. Um, and so indecision 
means that you have rejected him. Um, and that's hard because especially for folks who want to think it all out and they want time. Um, that comes to what another one of those people, that, that punishment. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, I like you, I, I plead with folks and, and going back all the way back to what Jim said of knowing paradise now, knowing that abundant life now, you don't have to wait or think, okay, well, I'll wait to my death bed and then I'll make that decision and then I'll have paradise then. We can know abundant life now. Is it perfect? No. Is it without crisis? No. Is it without pain? No. But I'm not alone. I'm walking with Christ and I know that there is, um, that he's never going to leave me or forsake me in that. Um, and I'd rather trust in him than trust in myself. <laughs> I'm not a good God. I'm not a good God to follow. Um, and so... I, I, with you, I, I, I plead for folks to come to know him. Excellent. Well, I want to thank all you guys for taking time out to come together and allow us to uh, look at these verses. Um, I'm going to encourage uh, those who are watching this video uh, to take some time, go over the verses, perhaps talk to your family about them. And then here's what I'd like to ask you to do on our Facebook page. You can comment here or you can, comment on Facebook, uh, perhaps take one of these verses and say, there is something I saw that I'd like to share from that. And uh, I think it'd be neat on Saturday for our Facebook page to be full of observations from the seven sayings of Jesus. So we're now going to extend to you uh, the opportunity to share some of your insights with us uh, on Saturday. And so we have those to read as we prepare for Easter. And then we invite you to join us on Easter Sunday at 11 a.m. Uh, tune in early at 10 a.m. Uh, you can catch Eastern Heights Latino, a wonderful way of worship to get started. And uh, then uh, just take it right on into the 11 o'clock worship. So before we go, has anyone got any final statements or would you all like to say goodbye uh, before we end our video? Bye. Bye. Oh. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to close this up in a word of prayer. Lord, again, we thank you for this time of technology and the ability to be able to spend time doing this. And Lord, we just pray that um, we might take seriously these passages, be mindful of your death, celebrating your resurrection. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Tune in with us. And we will see you Easter morning. God bless.